Hello and welcome to online lecture number 10 for Chemistry 1101 during the spring semester of 2020. We are still in chapter nine. Chapter nine has been all about solutions, understanding how to express the concentration of solutions, and as we'll get into here next couple of lessons, how we can then use that information to predict the behavior of those solutions, the properties of those solutions. And the one last part we need to understand before we get there is what's happening when a solution is created. What's happening specifically with the dissolving process. When I add a solute to water and it dissolves, what kind of chemistry is occurring there? So for example, if I make an aqueous solution of salt and water, an aqueous solution is a homogeneous mixture, as all solutions are, and it's called an aqueous solution because the solvent is water. So if I want to make a sodium chloride aqueous solution, as many of us have done in the past, we would add solid sodium chloride, this is your table salt, add that to water, and then mix it dissolve. So that's what we see macroscopically. The question is, what's actually happening at the microscopic level and what we can't actually see? But what have we have to, have to imagine is happening in order to explain the behavior of that solution? Fortunately, there have been some simulations developed to help us visualize what we think is happening, help us visualize what we can't actually in real life see. So if I take table salt and I sprinkle it into water, obviously this, the solution's properties will change. It'll now be, have a salty taste to it where it didn't have a salty taste to it. We can see that as I continue to add more salt to it, the molar concentration of salt will increase. Another observation I can make would be I could add a connectivity tester. This is just a light bulb connected to a battery. And if the circuit's complete, in other words, if there are ions present in the solution, then the light bulb will light up. So when I immerse the connectivity tester into the solution, we see that the light bulb lights up, which is evidence that even though we can't see it, there's evidence that there must be ions present in my solution. Better idea is what we think is happening. Same idea, adding sodium chloride to water. But this time, I'm visualizing sodium chloride as what it actually is, a mixed a ionic compound composed of sodium ions and chloride ions. The sodium ions are represented by the purple spheres and the chloride ions are represented by the green spheres. And then when we unpause it, we think's happening as soon as that solid sodium chloride hits the water, the sodium chloride breaks up into its individual ions, sodium ions and chloride ions. And then even a closer look at what's happening, see individual water molecules, we add sodium chloride. And as soon as we add the sodium chloride, it dissolves. And when it dissolves, it breaks up into its individual ions, sodium ions and chloride ions. So that's the key in all these simulations is that all the evidence indicates that when a soluble ionic compound dissolves, it breaks into its individual cations and anions. And that's our model of what we think is happening when a soluble ionic compound dissolves. So when sodium chloride dissolves, when we represent sodium chloride in the dissolved state as NaCl aqueous, our picture should look like this, where we actually have the individual sodium ions and chloride ions that are how separated from one another in the solution. We have ions, which explains why the solution was able to conduct electricity. So if I want to write a chemical equation to represent this process, to represent the process of dissolving a soluble ionic compound in water, and specifically in this case, sodium chloride, there's a couple different ways I can do this. The first way I can represent the dissolving of solid sodium chloride in water would be like this, sodium chloride solid. So we start with, and then and now dissolved, I could represent that as sodium chloride aqueous. And that's a perfectly fine way of showing what's actually occurring here, that we're going from the solid state to the aqueous state, but this is not the best way of representing this process, because as is, it's a little bit misleading, because you might imagine that if this is the case, then what we actually have present in our solution would be the sodium chloride molecule, so to speak, floating around. And that's not what our model suggests. That's not what all the experimental observational evidence suggests. So though we sometimes see this for certain contexts, for our purposes though, we want to be able to write it more accurately. And the best way of writing, of writing a chemical equation describing what's actually occurring is not as 
sodium chloride, solid sodium chloride aqueous, but rather to really represent what's occurring, what's occurring, remember, is sodium ions separated from chloride ions, chloride ions separated from sodium ions. So we represent that by showing we have sodium ions in the aqueous state and we have chloride ions in the aqueous state. This is a better way of representing what's actually occurring when a side ionic compound dissolves in water, it produces ions, and particularly those ions come from the ionic bonds breaking in the ionic compound. So the sodium ions separate from chloride ions, the chloride ions separate from sodium ions. Likewise, if we wanted to make a solution of silver nitrate in water, we take solid silver nitrate, add that to water, silver nitrate, because it's a nitrate salt, all nitrate containing compounds are soluble, silver nitrate would expect to be soluble. We mix it, it dissolves, and based upon our model for sodium chloride, we'd expect that when another soluble ionic compound like silver nitrate dissolves, it breaks into its individual cations and anions. So our picture of what silver nitrate looks like in the aqueous state would look like this, where we have the silver ions separated from the nitrate ions. Notice that nitrate is a polyatomic ion. Because it's a polyatomic ion and just this dissolving process, nitrate, like all other polyatomic ions, those atoms that make up that polyatomic ion stay together. The actual polyatomic ion itself does not break up into even smaller pieces. So you have the cation separated from its anion. To represent that in a chemical equation, it might look like this, silver nitrate add to water. So we could, as we talked about with sodium chloride, we could write it as silver nitrate from the solid phase to the aqueous phase, but that's a little bit misleading. So we wanna be as accurate as possible. So a better way of writing it, a better way of expressing what's actually occurring here, which is we actually have silver ions separated from nitrate ions, and nitrate ions separate from silver ions. It's show that what's occurring is that the silver nitrate breaks up into individual particles, individual ions to produce silver ions in the aqueous state and nitrate ions also in the aqueous state. So what's true for sodium chloride and silver nitrate is true for all soluble ionic compounds is that they'll break up into according to our model and experimental data, they break up into their individual ions. For molecular compounds, the process we think is a little bit different. So I wanna make a sugar solution. Sugar is also known as sucrose, C12, H22O11. Notice it's composed completely of non-metal atoms. That's one way we can tell that it's a molecular compound. So when we dissolve a molecular compound to sugar in water, we could add solid sugar to water, mix dissolve, and then we have to imagine what must be happening when that solid sugar dissolves in water. Fortunately, there's a simulation for that as well. So if I take table sugar, add that to water, we know it dissolves, and as we add more table sugar to water, more of that dissolves, and so as a consequence, the molar concentration of sugar will continue to increase. So now, of course, the solution, the solution now has a sweet taste to it that I didn't have before. And the more sugar I add to it, the sweeter that taste is going to be. I could do the same connectivity test. You can, you can remember, this is a test for ions. If there are ions present, the circuit will be complete, and the light bulb will light up. If I immerse this into my sugar solution, nothing happens. So sugar's present, but this is a negative test for ions. Take a closer look at what you think's happening. When I add sugar to my water, you have these molecular compounds, sugar molecules composed of quite a few atoms. When you add that to water, then the sugar molecules themselves separate from one another. Remember in the solid phase, they'll be attracted to one another via those intermolecular forces. But once they hit the water and dissolve, they separate from one another. But notice that the individual sugar molecules remain intact. It's an important distinction between molecular compounds dissolving in water and ionic compounds dissolving in water. And finally, a much closer look, we have table sugar, in this case, two sugar molecules that are currently attracted to one another, held together, so to speak, by these intermolecular forces, primarily hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole forces. But when they dissolve in water, the solid sugar 
dissolves, and when it dissolves, the sugar molecules separate from one another. The water molecule is able to get in there, break apart those intermolecular forces, and keep these molecules separate from one another. So the distinction these models and simulations are trying to indicate is that when a molecular compound dissolves, the intact molecules separate from one another. So the molecules are still intact, just one molecule separates itself from another molecule. So when we have sugar in aqueous solution, the solid sugar molecules attract to one another, they're able to separate from one another, but otherwise remain intact. So to indicate that with a chemical equation would look like this. We add table sugar to water, and because our picture, remember table sugar, we represent these, these blobs as sugar molecules, in the aqueous state, they separate from one another. But otherwise, they remain intact. So our best way of representing this would be simply as the same substance, C12, H22, O11, but now it's in the aqueous state, where the implication is that this, this notation indicates that the molecules are now separated from one another, but otherwise are intact. So what we want to be able to do is that for any soluble substance, be able to predict what's going to happen to that substance when it does dissolve in water. And the two possibilities are either if it's ionic, ionic compound, it will break apart into its individual ions. If it's a molecular compound, then individual molecules separate from one another. So for example, these five, where we have a variety of both ionic compounds and other compounds, and we want to complete the equation describing this physical process of dissolving. In other words, what's going to happen when calcium chloride dissolves, what's going to happen when sodium phosphate dissolves, et cetera. Because we'll see this is going to be a part of helping us explain the behaviors of these solutions a little bit later. So with calcium chloride solid, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, is this an ionic compound or a molecular compound? Notice that we have a metal, calcium, and metals will only ever be part of ionic compounds. So as an ionic compound, we'd expect, like sodium chloride and silver nitrate, that this ionic compound, when it does dissolve in water, will break apart into its individual ions. So we want to, want to balance the equation describing that process. So calcium chloride, as an ionic compound, will break up into its ions. Its ions will be calcium in the aqueous state and chloride in the aqueous state. And then to be balanced, notice that we have to have two chlorides to give us a balanced equation. So when calcium chloride dissolves, it breaks up into its ions, its cation and its anion, one cation, one calcium ion, and two anions. This two here just indicates that in the neutral compound, we had to have two chloride ions for every one calcium ion to give us an overall neutral compound. So essentially, for the most part, unless it's part of a polyatomic ion, these subscripts will give us our coefficients as products. And we'll see that over and over again in these examples. Our next example is sodium phosphate. Once again, we have to ask ourselves, is this an ionic compound or a molecular compound? And there's two ways to determine that this is a ionic compound. One is there's a metal present, sodium, and metals are always part of ionic compounds. Or secondly, we might recognize PO4 as one of those special polyatomic ions. And polyatomic ions will also only be part of ionic compounds. So because it's an ionic compound, it will break apart into its individual ions. So sodium phosphate will break apart into sodium ions and phosphate ions. So the polyatomic ion dissolved nitrate stays together. And to be balanced, we need to have three sodium ions becomes three sodium ions. So one sodium phosphate breaks up into three sodium ions and one phosphate ion. This is a chemical equation, the best chemical equation we can write to best describe what's actually occurring when solid sodium phosphate dissolves in water. Our third example is CH3OH, liquid. We ask, ask ourselves, is this a molecular compound or ionic? And this is a molecular compound because all the atoms in this compound are nonmetals. Also, we can see that it does not contain a metal 
or and or a platongion. So for those reasons and others, we conclude this is a molecular compound like sucrose from the previous slide. As a result, because it is a molecular compound, when it does dissolve, the molecules stay intact. So to represent that, we just rewrite the formula as is and just change the physical state from the liquid phase to the aqueous phase. So this would be true for this molecular compound as well as all the molecular compounds. For every one molecule that dissolves, we get one dissolved molecule. Our fourth example is aluminum nitrate. And we're going to describe and write an equation describing the process of aluminum nitrate dissolving. So is this ionic or molecular? Well, it's ionic because we have a metal, aluminum, as well as we know it's ionic because we have a polyatomic ion, the nitrate ion. So it's ionic, so which means that when we write the equation, we're going to represent what's happening when it does dissolve by breaking up that ionic compound into its individual ions. So to represent that, aluminum nitrate will dissolve into aluminum ions, and then the anion is a nitrate anion. And to make sure it's balanced, notice we have three nitrates, so we need to have three nitrates. And so again, this three is part of the formula, it just tells us that we have to have three nitrates, every one aluminum, to give us electrically neutral compound. So when that dissolves, we get one aluminum and three of these nitrate ions. And the last example we'll look at is C6H12O6. Notice all nonmetal atoms, no metals, no polytonic ions. So we must conclude this is a molecular compound. So as a molecular compound, C6H12O6, it's going to remain intact. Just individual molecules will separate from one another. So we represent that as C6H12O6, the same formula, and then just change the physical state aqueous. So as we've seen in this lesson, when ionic compounds dissolve, they break up into their individual ions, cations and anions, Whereas when molecular compounds dissolve, individual intact molecules separate from one another.